And I'd like to thank the Center for um, Urban History of East Central Europe for not only just for inviting me to speak here, but actually for making me sit down and put together my thoughts on this uh, issue, uh, which I realized as I was writing it, as I was putting it together, you know, you have the, everybody who works as a scholar has sort of things floating in their head. And, and you rarely have a moment to concentrate them and, and put them into some kind of uh, tale. And uh, so I'm very grateful that I was provoked into writing this. And I hope that you find it at least half as interesting listening to it as I did working on it. So I'm going to talk about, um, well, let me put it another way. I'm not going to talk about four instances of violence, but I'm going to refer to four instances of violence. Uh, one is the Great Terror in the Soviet Union you know, which lasted from 1936 to 1938, which claimed at least 100,000 murders of people. Um, and the victims in large measure were peasants and national minorities. Uh, and for our purposes, the important one that I'll, I'll refer to in my talk is at Vinitsa in uh, uh, in, um, in Podilia, uh, not really too far away from here, where there were thousands of, uh, of uh, people massacred during the Great Terror. So that's one point would be the Great Terror. The other is the uh, well-known, I think, mass murder of Polish officers and intelligentsia by the Soviets, mainly in 1940. And the most famous example is is the murders in Katyn. You might have seen the really powerful film by uh, Andrzej Wajda on Katyn. Um, and, uh, but that, it wasn't just in Katyn. There were a number of places where the Soviets killed large numbers of Polish POWs and particularly officers and intelligentsia. And one was in uh, a place called Piane Khatke, which is now incorporated in the city of Kharkiv. So these things came very close to home. It's, that will be a second sort of point of reference. And the third, uh, that is, I'm going to talk about, or not talk about, but are the frame of reference for, for this, this talk, is the mass murder of uh, political prisoners in western Ukraine in the summer of 1941. Uh, when the Germans surprise invade, with the German surprise invasion of the summer of 1941, the Soviets were unable to evacuate all their prisoners. Uh, and uh, instead of just leaving them for the Germans, they decided to kill their political prisoners. And they killed them in large numbers. Uh, just in, uh, in Neville, you might know, the Lodzki prison, uh, Brigitki prison, uh, Zamostenio Street prison. These three prisons had uh, altogether, several thousand uh, uh, corpses found them then when the Germans came. And altogether, in the, in the Galician Oblast, uh, about 7,500 to uh, 10,000 victims uh, were found here. So that's my third point of reference. And the uh, fourth point of reference is the anti-Jewish violence uh, perpetrated by the Germans and their local collaborators. Now in Latvia, the Lithuanian Activist Front, I mean, excuse me, in Lithuania, the Lithuanian Activist Front uh, helped the Germans in their uh, pogroms, and in Western Ukraine, it was the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. And example, and it's not, it wasn't just pogroms, I'll come to that in a second. Uh, but examples would be pogroms here in Lviv on the 1st of July, 1941, a few days later in Zolotiu. Uh, but these pogroms, which were largely beatings, humiliations of, of Jews, were accompanied by mass executions. Uh, it wasn't 
yet the intention of the Germans perhaps to kill every single Jew, but they killed about 7,500 to 10,000 in, in, in Galicia just in uh, the summer of 1941. And this violence, as well as the mass murder of uh, political prisoners by the NKVD, the NKVD murders, also extended deep into Vol to Volk as well. Well, in. So those are just like, like maps, dots on a map. I'm not really going to talk in any detail about those murders. But we have to be aware of them, as you'll see. So if Timothy Snyder can talk and write about bloodlands, then we might be tempted to talk about blood times. Uh, and uh, except that these blood times would have extended from 1932 until 1947 and spread from Eastern Europe into Western Europe and Asia. But in this talk, I will be framed around the violence just of 1936 to 41, and just in Ukraine, primarily uh, even in Western Ukraine. I, I, wrote out, I wrote out some of this stuff because I know that I speak with an American accent and not everybody can, uh, can understand it. And I know that there's a really good syn synchronic translation, but I just neglected my duty here. You no, know, I was going to say, um, talking about these four instances of mass murder, there's also been some very good books or interesting books come out lately, very recently, on these subjects. So Kai Struga um, wrote this book, Deutsche Herrschaft Ukrainischer Nationalismus anti jüdische Gewalt, which is an account of the anti Jewish violence in 1941 in the summer. And the book next to it, The Great Western Ukrainian Prison Massacre of 1941, concerns the NKVD murders in the prisons. It's not as well researched or as um, authoritative as, the, as, as Struve's work on the anti Jewish violence but it contains a lot of sources, a lot of first-hand memoirs, and it's a very interesting uh, contribution to a literature that really didn't exist as a scholarly literature. <clears throat> so, um, so much violence accumulated in such a short time, and really as extends earlier and later, that I think that Ukraine is still in the process of working through all this traumatic violence. And uh, by working through, I'm referring to a term coined by uh, the psychiatrist Zygmunt Freud, whose theories I don't believe at all, but who sometimes comes up with interesting language. And although I don't believe in anything he writes, I love to read it because he's such an interesting writer. Anyway, so I have to admit that I borrowed something from him here. Uh, but it's, he defines or it's defined as a process that involves repeating, elaborating, and amplifying interpretations of actions and reactions. And it's part of the therapeutic treatment of mental illness. And, um, but when I'm using it, I'm using it in a very similar sense, in an analogous sense. I essentially mean thinking about trauma in a variety of ways so that we can come to terms with it or adjust to it, and then move beyond it, to heal through reflection and discussion. So this lecture is, uh, is intended precisely as a contribution to that working through process, process of healing. So it looks at the course of violent events through an oblique perspective, that is, through recounting cases of problematic identity, of confusion, uh, something is produced by the powerful violence. I'm not going to offer an account of the violence. Instead, I'm going to look just at the confusion it produced. Confusion about identity. So the lecture takes what I call an oblique perspective, that is, um, Uh, uh, an oblique perspective, it allows us, 
It looks at the problem of violence not directly, but so to speak, at a slant, out of the corner of the eye, but not directly, not in the blinding violence itself. And because of this oblique angle, I feel we can approach the violence closer in some ways, since it is indirect, less threatening to our sensibilities, and therefore perhaps more assimilable. And I want to say, too, that I think that this oblique approach, this indirect approach, uh, fits very well with Nikita Kadam's artwork, which is on display downstairs, uh, which also takes the oblique approach. Uh, his art does not try to depict the violence of that time, but depicts in paint and ink the photographs of the violence. He depicts depictions but it makes us think about trauma in a manageable way, in a less, less overwhelming way. So uh, the way I'm going to proceed is to look at cases of mistaken or false or falsified identity of both perpetrators and victims of the four horrible events I've listed. And the murderers occurred so rapidly, and the number of victims was so large, that both contemporaries and subsequent generations have had difficulties sorting out the question, who killed whom? So, I'll start with a case that comes right from the beginning of all this confusion, right from the summer of 1941. And it's a case that Kai Struve uh, discusses and documents very well in that excellent monograph, Deutsche Herrschaft, Ukrainische Nationalismus, Antidische Gewalt. So on the 12th of July, 1941, uh, the German security police, Sicherheitsdienst, shot 23 Jews in woods near Drohovich. About 10 days later, local Ukrainians uh, from a nearby village discovered the mass grave, but misidentified it as the work of the NKVD. Because in all the newspapers and in all the rumors, everybody was so concerned about the NKVD murders of political prisoners. And they were finding them all over the place, in salt mines, in fields, in prisons. And so they assumed that these 23 people shot in the woods were victims of the NKVD. And they expected that, uh, uh, you know what, I have to get my pen out. Sorry. When I find a mistake in my writing, I always correct it even if I'm in the middle of a lecture. Um, uh, anyways, and they considered them rather Ukrainian heroes who suffered for the Ukrainian cause at the hands of the NKVD. <coughs> but when they, when they exhumed the bodies from the mass grave, they found identification papers that showed that these victims were not Ukrainians at all, but had, pace, had uh, uh, passports and identification papers indicating that they were Jews. Now, the Greek Catholic priest could not believe that these were Jews. He believed that they were Ukrainians killed by the NKVD. And he felt that in order to insult the Ukrainians, that the NKVD had planted Jewish identification papers on them. So they were given them a solemn Christian uh, burial uh, as, as Ukrainian uh, heroes. The Germans knew better, but they did not bother to correct the impression. They let the confusion reign. It was to their, in their interest. Uh, and then there's famous cases of this. Um, in spring of 1943, for propaganda purposes, <coughs> The Germans exhumed older sites of Soviet crimes. 
So they, for instance, were the ones to discover the mass murders at Katyn, Katyn, uh, post officers from 1940, and they opened up those graves. And as you know, they were very successful in that propaganda campaign. They were able to break relations between the Polish government in exile and the Soviet Union, which up until that time had held their noses and collaborated with one another. And they also then, in the spring of 1941, 43, uh, opened up a grave at Vinitsa, a grave where uh, victims of the uh, Great Terror were buried, thousands of them, mainly Ukrainians, mainly from 1937 to 1938. And the Germans publicized these cases and said, look who we're fighting against, these Bolsheviks, mass criminals, mass murderers. And the Soviets denied their responsibility for the killings and blamed the Germans instead. And as late as uh, 1959, uh, the scholarly journal the Yad Vashem Studies published, as if an authentic source to the history of the Jewish community in Ukraine, uh, the testimony of a German officer in Soviet captivity um, about the mass graves uh, found and exhumed in Venus in 1943. And he said that the corpses buried there were Jews that the Germans themselves had killed two months previously. But, he testified, the Germans framed the Soviet GPU for the murder. In other words, they opened up a genuine mass grave of uh, victims of the Great Terror, the Germans did, and the Soviets said, were able to get testimonies from captured German officers that they were Jews there. So confusion again. And even at this moment, as late in the day as now, there is a professor in the United States of America who believes that the Germans were the ones who murdered the victims at Katyn, uh, although it would seem that the whole world by now should know that the Soviets did it. But there's always room for sort of odd political views, so he published his uh, expose on Katyn uh, in, uh, in the website of the Stalin Society of North America. So the, and the Soviets also blame the NKVD murders of the summer of 1941 on the Germans. Again, they would not take the responsibility and push it on the Germans. As early as the 12th of July, 1941, Molotov blamed the NKVD murders on the Germans. And because the uh, Polish government in exile had found out about the murders at Bogitki, they were calling for an investigation. And the British ambassador uh, to the Soviet Union, Richard Stafford Cripps, made an inquiry to Molotov. And uh, Molotov uh, answered him as follows. Now I'm going to read it in Russian. If you need an English translation, let me know. Molotov said, and I apologize for my bad uh, Russian pronunciation. В тюрьмах города Львова и в частности в тюрьме Бригитки в момент ухода советских властей действительно осталась некоторая часть заключенных, и среди них не более 150 поляков. Эти лица остались на месте вследствие того, что в тогдашних условиях Не было никакой возможности вывести их из тюрем без риска для жизни. Но как это было установлено специальной проверкой, проведенной компетентными советскими органами, ни один из заключенных не был подвергнут на каким-либо репрессиям, ни вообще несправедливому обращению. Не исключено, однако, что над этими заключенными Немцы учинили расправу, а теперь стремятся скрыть свое преступление и распространять провокационные небылицы о советских властях. В 
and anybody who was in the Soviet's power, for whatever reason, uh, could not talk about the murder of, uh, of uh, political prisoners by the NKVD. So, uh, that's Molotov. Then there's the interesting case of Philip Friedman. Philip Friedman was a... Let me get his picture before I go any further. That's his, his uh, application for rescue during the war. Philip Friedman was an uh, excellent uh, historian of uh, Galician Jews. He wrote for his doctoral uh, dissertation, a book which was, which was published in German on the uh, emancipation of Galician Jews in the 1860s. And he also wrote, well, it was interesting to me, he wrote a study of uh, Jewish agriculturalists in Yiddish. Um, and he was one of the real up-and-coming Jewish historians. He, was, he wasn't a, just an antiquarian like, say, Meyer Bawaban was. He was a guy who really understood history and applied it to the East European Jews. Very smart man. And during the Holocaust, uh, he was involved already in the Central Jewish Historical Commission and began collecting testimonies and trying to figure out what was happening. And eventually, he was to write some very important uh, works on Holocaust history, but especially on Ukrainian-Jewish relations during the war, very balanced. He wrote a, a, also a, a book, Historia Zagwadov Zhidov Lvovsky, History of the Destruction of the, of the Lviv Jews. A, a, a very interesting man, very smart. But sometimes when you're with totalitarian regimes, you uh, don't always tell the truth. So in 1946, uh, he gave a testimony to the Soviet Commission for the Study of the History of the Great Patriotic War that the Germans had rounded up Jews when they took Lviv on 30th of June 1941, shot them in prisons, disguised their nationality, and blamed the episode on the NKVD. So I'll read his exact words in Ukraine. And again, if anybody needs an English translation, let me know. As Nishni Nyobreyu Misi Livovi Puchaos is Pesho Nyak Prekudu Nimsi Utopto Trice, Tichato Ho Cherdes Sor Pesho Roku. Prote na Persik Porak Nimsi Provadle says Nishni Provocazino. Korestujuches Vithodom Ledjansk Visk, Deku Chastino Yobresko Nasaunia Nimsi Zavele do Turem, Itam Postrelial. Razom s tem persvidovaz i druga meta. Podati jak preklad zvirst, jak preklad zvirst en kavude, šo pered svojim uhodom z Ilivova v cimto rozstriljale, rozstriljale politične vjazne. So he, he signed this testimony in 1946. You can find this, by the way, on a website where uh, um, where it's also treated as though it's an actual source to Jewish history. Uh, so it's a contemporary thing. But in actual fact, of course, uh, in his scholarly work, he never, never spoke of it like that. In his scholarly work, he correctly attributed the murders to the NKVD. Uh, then the confusion. Then the confusion of Soviet and Nazi victims in Galicia became part of the controversy surrounding an important exhibition in the German Federal Republic. The Wehrmachtsausstellung opened in 1995. Uh, I've got some pictures from it. Uh, the, this picture picture shows people in Munich uh, looking at the exhibition where they showed photographs of the Wehrmacht. The Wehrmacht is the regular German army, the Wehrmacht's crimes. Um, the exhibition toured the whole country 
in an effort to dispel the myth that only the SS was involved in war crimes and that the soldiers of the uh, Wehrmacht uh, retained their honor. So, uh, this was the way the Germans dealt with war guilt uh, and, and the crimes like the Holocaust, the enslavement of East Europeans, the murder of the POWs, all the things you know, that the Germans did during the Second World War, which was so horrible, was to imagine that it was a small minority, the SS that did it, and that ordinary soldiers were okay. As, uh, there's a famous book in German called Opa war kein Nazi. Grandpa was no Nazi. And it's about how people remember and, and uh, somehow find that all the things that were done wrong were done by other people, not by their good grandfathers and things like that. So this exhibition was part of the Germans grappling with a difficult historical memory. And it was part of their own working through, their working through of, of the trauma of the difficult historical memory. And not everybody uh, went along with the exhibition. So down here, we see demonstrators uh, that say, um, uh, fame or glory and honor to the, to the Wehrmacht, to the German, German troops. But the exhibit, exhibition showed, as you can see, many photographs of the army's atrocities. Uh, in 1999, however, uh, the historian and political activist Bogdan Musial wrote an article. Oh, I, I meant to give a picture of that article. It's called Pictures from an Exhibition, which you know, relates to the Mussorgsky and Nobel uh, work. Uh, Pictures from an Exhibition wrote an article demonstrating Bilder aus einer Ausstellung that some of the photos showed not crimes of the Wehrmacht but victims of the NKVD. Because the German soldiers came into the territory, they took a lot of pictures, they bought pictures, and a lot of the pictures in 1941 were of the crimes of the NKVD in the prisons. Later, however, scholars realized that some of the pictures that Musa described as depicting the NKVD victims actually depicted the corpses of Jews who had been brought to the prison sites to exhume the NKVD victims. They had subsequently been shot by the Germans. So here you see a picture. This picture was in the Wehrmacht uh, Ausstellung, you know, and, and, it's, and uh, it's one of the pictures that Musau in his article reproduced. And he said that this was a picture of the uh, NKVD murders in Birgitki prison. But it's not. You can see there's a number of uh, oops, important differences. For one thing, all the clothes are bright and clean. If you looked at the victims of the NKVD uh, murders, which I didn't have the sense to put on, on my PowerPoint, if you looked at the pictures there, you would see that they were all gray, dirty, they'd been dug up from the earth. They'd been underground. This man has a white shirt that could be a commercial for laundry detergent. He's got suspenders on. Do prison authorities usually let people have their suspenders on? Then the corpses uh, that the NKVD, uh, uh, of the people the NKVD killed, were buried, <coughs> then exhumed, and then lined in rows. But here people are lying every which way, higgledy piggledy. And once you look at it even closer, you see all these tools here. Those are tools for exhuming the bodies. So very clearly, very clearly, well, once you analyze it, you realize that those are the Jews who had come in, exhumed the bodies, and then we have numerous 
uh, testimonies to this effect that the Germans then shot. So uh, there's a case again of confusion and how hard it is to sort it out. First it was first it was a Wehrmacht crime, then it was uh, a, a Soviet crime, and then once again it's uh, a Wehrmacht crime. Although I, I suspect actually it wasn't the Wehrmacht, I suspect it was one of the Einsatz commandos, but we don't know for sure. Uh, and this, this is not over. Uh, it continues to this very day. Um, so in 2011, mass burials were discovered on the grounds of the prison in Volinsk. Vol and uh, very soon thereafter, Polish and Ukrainian officials, experts and journalists, determined the victims to be Polish POWs killed by the NKVD sometime between 1939 and 41, probably 1940. 367 skeletons were exhumed and solemnly reburied by Polish and Ukrainian priests. Now, it's quite possible, I have an open mind on this, I'm confused really, that the human remains did belong to victims of the NKVD. I would have to study the uh, issue myself in depth, and I would have to have access to all the reports and forensic evidence. But even that would take me outside of what I can do, so I don't really have a, an actual opinion. But there's also evidence that the skeletons found were not of Poles killed by the Soviets, but of Jews killed by the <laughs> Germans with the aid of the Ukrainian police in 1941. Uh, Ivan Katsunovsky, uh, a political scientist at the University of Ottawa, has challenged that official view uh, based on both documentary and forensic evidence. Documentary evidence based on memoirs and German documents and based on uh, the forensic evidence, that is what was discovered in the digging up. And here's what he writes. The newly found victims in Volodymyr Volinsky were clearly executed in large groups, and almost no remains of clothes or footwear were found. They included many small children, women, and elderly. Both of these are consistent with Nazi executions and not Soviet executions. There are eyewitness reports from Jewish survivors about Nazi executions carried out with assistance of the Ukrainian police in the area of the Volodymyr Volinsky prison in 1941 and 1942." Unquote. Let me just um, uh, unpack a little of that. Once procedures were worked out, there were different ways of killing that the Nazis and the Germans used and people trained by them used, and the way the Soviets killed. I don't know how many of you saw the movie Kate. It's a very good movie, and you should try to see it. But the, 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 it's a slow process, but the normal way that the Soviet security organs killed was the hands would be tied behind the back, either with uh, you know, rope, it could be rope, but it could also be barbed wire, it could be almost anything that would, would hold it behind the back. The prisoner was, was held down like this, and, and then was shot in, in the back of the head with a low caliber uh, revolver. There's always a hole in the back of the head. And it was a standard practice they'd been using uh, at least since the Great Terror. At least since the Great Terror. Uh, and there are numerous descriptions of it and lots of forensic evidence and the, and the um, the medical team that worked at uh, Venus uh, gives a lot of details. So there is a way that the Soviets killed, and you can tell. It. Also, the victims were clothed. If you watch it, Cotton, you'll see they're wearing their clothes. Normally, normally, though not always, they would not kill uh, children. They were mainly interested in adults. The Germans had a different way of killing. At first, it was Everything was improvised. First murders were improvised. A lot of drownings, a lot of stuff like that. 
But once they got it down, they had it down to a different method, which involved having a, having a, oh, I can see, add to the Soviet things, that they would usually have a tractor or a truck going to muffle the shots. That's why they used low revolvers to keep it secret. Uh, the Germans didn't have uh, anything to keep it quiet or secret. They would often do their killing in public places or fairly public places. They would use uh, rifles, uh, mainly. Uh, sometimes they would use automatic rifles, but normally they used just rifle fire. Um, some of their collaborators used uh, blunt instruments, the cameras and things like that. But the victims, when they were killed, would be first stripped naked. Uh, and they would, uh, they would um, uh, later usually be robbed of the gold in their teeth. And, you know, there was a whole process that they had developed for it. And they killed them right near the, um, the death sites. And they, um, um, well, anyways, so they, they, ha they had a different methodology, and it, and it shows up. It shows up when you find it. And they, oh, and they also killed uh, anybody of any age. And you find babies in their mass graves. You find old people in their mass graves. Because in the nature of their uh, project, they were interested in anybody with a certain genetic code or blood, as they would have called it in those days. Anyways, so there are things you can use in your forensic evidence. So in this case, the fact that they're naked and there's so many children in them made me wonder whether, you know, which is the correct version. But as I say, I have an open mind. Then there's the case of a Brazilian monastery in Jopla. This is actually an older case, but, but I want to come, I, I, put, it, I put, it, put it here because it, it, it'll make more sense when I talk about it now. So in 2002, uh, they found about 200 skeletons uh, in the, buried in the basements of the Brazilian monastery in Joko. And in the end, when they were done with all the exhumations, so they were close to, closer to 300 that they had found. And a third of them belonged to children, and all, all of the, oh my God, how do we have time? And all the corpses were naked. All of them. So, just on that basis alone, if, you, if that was the only information I had, I would say, oh yeah, that sounds like the German method of execution in mass burial. But immediately, when it was uh, opened up, suspicion fell on the NKVD. Local people remembered them commandering the monastery in 1947, and a coin from 1946 was found among the graves. So the Lviv Society Memorial uh, undertook to investigate the find, but then abandoned their work for years. They didn't do anything. Nothing was heard from them. And then in 2006, the citizens of Jokva, with the support of the, the party Svoboda and the memorial organization Pamyat, Memory, took it upon themselves to give the remains a Christian reburial. And I wonder if there's not some confusion here too. Interestingly, interestingly, uh, dozens of human remains were found in the Dominican monastery, not Basilian, but Dominican monastery in Jofa, who at first were also identified as victims of the NKVD. But it turned out, after all the forensic evidence was in, that there were actually the bodies of people who had been buried there centuries beforehand, as part of an ordinary burial. So, it's not an easy thing. You know, it's not just, you know, Hercule Poirot or somebody coming here, one of the TV centers. So now I'll, I'll come to my uh, conclusions. Oops, what did I do? I did that thing. All right, So as I said at the beginning of my talk, it is intended as a contribution to the process of working through the trauma which lingers after the violence. Confusion remains 
around the events of the late 1930s and 1940s and about the perpetrators and about the victims. And here I have in mind just, not just the individual cases I enumerated, cases of individual incidents of confused identity. There is a larger problem of continuing confusion, uh, exacerbated by deliberate obfuscation, by deliberate skewing of the uh, picture. And I refer to the direction taken by the present day uh, Ukrainian state in legislating and promoting a particular kind of historical memory, one that shines its light only upon foreigners, Chu Xinxi, the infamous others as perpetrators of violence, and grants recognition only to victims who are ours, that is, ethnic Ukrainians. It's also a form of confusion. My fervent hope is that even this more deliberate confusion is also part of the process of working through the tremendous violence that scorched this land. And that someday, the confusion will lift like a fog in the clarity of day. And that Ukraine will emerge from the nightmare with a clearer head and a brighter attitude. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation, for your lecture, and now we have the opportunity to ask questions, to share our reflections. You can ask in Ukrainian. Professor Kimka understands, um, is quite fluent in, 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 in Ukrainian and English, so uh, I open the floor to questions and reflections. Uh, so better to speak English or Ukrainian? How is it better? So I, I, my native language is English. Okay, I understand. So, uh, just uh, the question uh, about these uh, victims in the prisons at the end of June 1941. They were executed by the Bolsheviks, it's absolutely understandable. Uh, I mean, not from the moral point of view, but from the point of view that the corresponding people, police collaborators, KGB collaborators, I mean, they were ordered to do it, and they... but due to different evidences, Many of these people were tortured before this. Actually, uh, uh, deadly tortured. Tortured to death. It's uh, just a general point which is emphasized by the historians. How do you think? What was the reason of this? Thank you. Yeah, the question of torture. There are three, three different theories. One is that they were tortured, <coughs> and that book by um, Motun Kebushenska, the great Western Ukrainian prison massacre, defends the idea that they were tortured. Second theory, which is held by um, Kai Struve, who did a lot more research on it than did Motil and Ksepyshensky, is that this was, that the wounds and things that were uh, uh, attributed to the corpses were normal from decay and not, not actual torture, not evidence of torture. And the third theory had by, held by people like Bogdan Musel and his intellectual opponent, Johannes Hannes Herr, is that there was a deliberate, uh, that the um, a special unit of uh, Nachtigall went in there and, and uh, 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 dismembered the bodies to make people angry. So those are the three theories. Each of them has some evidence behind it. Uh, even the third one, which which I don't subscribe to, but you know, the rumor at the time was um, there was um, among Jewish medical students 
was that if those legs had been cut off during the, um, during the torture, then more blood would have been there. And that, in fact, there wasn't, so they figured that the legs were cut off after the, after the death of the prisoners and that it was a setup. I don't think that that's the case. I don't think they had time for that kind of torture. I think that, um, now, I don't want to even for a second pretend that the, the operatives of the NKVD were not cruel and that they did torture people. We have lots of evidence of that, lots of evidence of that. But usually they tortured to get information. Uh, this would be an odd case where there was some kind of collective frenzy, an orgy of torture. It would be very odd, I think, for it to, to, to have happened as, as we imagine it. Uh, certainly the crucified priest and the, because um, there's a story of the crucified priest, and there's the story of the pregnant woman whose, whose belly is ripped open. Uh, but those two are certainly not true. The, the evidence from all the visitors puts those out. But the kinds of wounds you saw could come from also from disintegration of the body because the skin would slip off. They would have been murdered probably something like the 22nd, 23rd, 24th of June. It was a very hot summer and the bodies were decomposing. I find it, I find it harder to believe that they took the time to torture these people uh, and I, I incline more to the Struve thesis. That's all I can say. I can't, I haven't made up my mind 100%. Uh, so I wanted to ask um, about the Nuremberg process, the trials at Nuremberg. This was a process that, a trial that uh, attempted to find answers to the question of, you know, who killed whom. So they were looking into all of these mass murders. But in your, in your opinion, why was Katyn silenced? Why did people not rush to look into Katyn? And will the research in the 21st century lead to any... I'm not talking about similar processes, because of course people who had anything to do are probably at the end of their lives. But should we, should we be looking into a new, new things in this process? In, in your opinion, whether there's more, to, whether there's more, let me make sure I understood your question. Whether there's more to study about these processes. The first question that was asked me, I think, gives an idea that really we, we still have to be thinking about these things and working them through. There's questions. For instance, I'll give you an example. But to answer that gentleman's question, the way you really would have to do it is you would have to uh, get a fairly, make a collection of, of all the statements about, about the, what they found on the bodies. You would have to look into reports of other mass murders and the disintegration of bodies and find out you know, the real forensic analysis, just like a policeman would do. He would have to know how long the body, you know, what would happen. Uh, we would have to do that. Uh, and I think you would have to use, therefore, comparative methods. And in the other cases, and are there other cases where it looked like torture? Now, there's a few, few things to add to that. You'd have to look also, like right away it was reported as torture. It was reported in gruesome detail because it was very much in the interest both of the Germans and of certain Ukrainian leaders to mobilize anger, indignation, 
as they were going on in the war against the Bolsheviks. So there was no room for any other kind of opinion. And, and this was fanned in the German press and in the Ukrainian press. Uh, the other thing that's sort of odd is you'd have to look at Soviet documentation. Now there's, you know, we know the documentation that says to kill these people. But there's also documentation which shows that some of the NKVD men were prosecuted for excesses during these murders for shooting people on their own initiative, or for doing, or for mistreating them, which is also very odd. And uh, I, I heard a paper by a scholar who looked at these, but they haven't really been touched. You know, they haven't really been studied. There's no publication on it. So, yes, there's a lot of room to, 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 to work on, the, on these processes. And um, I think, you know, I didn't say it in the paper because it didn't come up. But you also have to think about it in the, in the larger term. This was a major moment of preventive murder. And the Bolsheviks had used preventive murder before. Even during the revolution, they used preventive murder. Actually, actually so did the UN use preventive murder. One would also want to put it in the context of preventive murder. I mean, there's so much work to be done. Yeah, and it has to be done comparatively. It has to be looked at as a larger problem. That's just one aspect. I could go through probably every one of these incidents where there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, a lot has been done on Katya. Vinitsa? Very little work. Very little work. It's a playground now there. You dance on top of the graves in Vinitsa. I wanted to ask about um, So the thing is, because we know that this exhumation was also used with the propagandist purposes, and it's not just a newspaper. Not just it wasn't just European doctors that were brought in, but there were whole delegations of the locals from various regions of occupied Ukraine. They they came together. They came to see this, and after they came home, they would present. They would speak in the press, and they say, "Oh, we saw this, and we saw our people killed, and things like that." It's interesting that I worked with a case like this when there was a group of people who came to Vinnytsia and then published a statement and after the war they, they started being arrested by the NKVD and they all denied uh, that, you know, that there were people killed by the NKVD. They said, well, even then we knew that these were victims of the Nazis and they wanted to fool us. But unlike the, the testimony of the German officer, these people's uh, statements were never publicized, so they deny that they deny that these were victims of the NKVD, and nobody's seen those cases because, uh, I mean, so I, I don't know what what the point would be for the NKVD to collect such things. I mean, were they afraid that they might face some sort of responsibility, or that there might be some sort of noise in the West, like with Katyn, at least minimally, or? Did people in the West even even discuss Vinnytsia in a kind of higher, on a higher scale that made the NKVD look for these statements or falsify them? Or, well, I think that they responded to, uh, to the press, um, to the German press, uh, the, 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 the German press and the press of the occupied territories. But later on. Um, uh, they also raised the question of uh, Vinnytsia in the 50s in America. And I don't know when they collected those signatures that you mentioned. 47, 48. All right, well, I think that maybe this has to do with, uh, I mean, maybe this was a general policy. Um, perhaps also with regard to the NKVD uh, murders in Lviv and others, so maybe it was a general, general campaign of collecting such testimony. They may have cre you know, cre made history, created history. I mean, it's, this is a totalitarian regime we're talking about. We're, we're talking about um, your presentations and also in, in, the, in, in your lecture and also in the exhibition, we're talking about the, a mass murder, about a group. And we frequently operate with these kind of generalizations of you know, Ukrainians, Poles, Jews. Um, 
And although there's a difference between how you use the category of ethnicity, you know, by, by the Soviets and by the uh, Nazi uh, authorities, how do we, you know, in writing, in, in writing, how, 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 do we, how, do we, how do we develop this brighter attitude, a more nuanced approach? How do we understand what happened and how, how to think about it? How do we approach the identification of victims? Because we discuss them and like you showed, you know, when you showed this photograph there, it's, 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 it's a pile of bodies, but you know, they're people and they're, I mean, it's, this sounds very banal and, and, and obvious, but the reason, the reason or the, 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 the casus of why they were built, so to speak, is not who they were in life. So how do we find, I mean, obviously you've worked a lot with the sources as to the uh, identification of individuals who were, who were perpetrators. So what are our, what's our capacity, our possibility to see beyond uh, the mass graves and the mass, the, the piles of bodies? How, how do we see, you know, the, the, the people, the individual people and their fate? What might we historians do? Thank you. I think there's, there's, there are masses of uh, memoirs uh, of survivors, of Jewish survivors. And they sometimes say, well, you know, my brother was sent to prison and he never came back. Or my, my father came back, but his brother didn't. Things like this. So it's possible in this way to trace um, so I even think that we might compare photographs. I've, I've worked a little bit on, you know, finding the faces, the faces of uh, the pogrom perpetrators, um, you know, and the faces of the militia, of the militias. And, um, you know, just now we're on the threshold of, 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 uh, of uh, facial recognition software. And I think because of this, we can um, return uh, some of the faces, some of the individuality to these people. And when I finish my book, when, when that day comes, as my grandma would say, when I finish my book, when I write my book, I will partially discuss this. So, you know, when I use the word Jew or Pole or Ukrainian or German, uh, especially when I use the word Jew, because, you know, the book will be on the Holocaust. That this is a term that the perpetrators themselves used. And so these were the people. And very often now I write, instead of the, Jew, uh, instead of the Jews, I write Jewish people, so, that, so as to, I try to take a step back from from this, but I know that it's very difficult. It's very difficult to step away from language. You know, it's this post post structuralism. You know, they were right, at least in that, at least in that sense. And it's the fact that we are prisoners of our language to an extent. And there are attempts to change our language, but um, so far, I think I will write on the problematic, the the, the pro problematic character of all of those identifications. And when I can, if I can, I mean, not always because sometimes it's tedious and boring, but I try to provide name and last name to the victim. And so I use memoirs where I say that such and such a person um, was 12 years old at this time or 16 years old at this time. They lived in this place, etc., etc. Because it's true, you know, once they're in a pile of bodies in, in, in a mass grave, obviously they've lost, they will have lost a lot of their humanity, just like their, their, as their bodies are decomposing, even so decomposing is their, 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 their individual, their individual ego, their individual self.
thank you. Thank you for the uh, presentation. I have a question uh, in terms of uh, working through uh, the traumatic past. And obviously, this academic component to, to establish the facts of what really happened, this one dimension of this process, this exhibition that we have today at the Center for Urban History is, is another possible, uh, is another possible uh, d dimension of this process. But I wanted to ask, what do you think, what else do you think should be part of this processing, of this working through, and what do you think Ukraine should stress above all? What do you think Ukraine should do above all to intensify this process or to make it more effective? Look, I think that scholars have a particular um, obligation in Ukraine because on the one hand you have the state propaganda and it distorts the picture. Maybe it's necessary for, for a time, I don't know, but I think that scholars have to look into these sensitive and controversial things so that we can at least... And we have to discuss these issues publicly, and so which demands a bit of a backbone, but people do it, it's, it's, it's possible. For instance, Vasil Rasevich is doing this, others are doing this, not only him, others do it as well. But, and I think this is, this is uh, the, the, the core thing. When, I, I forget when I was here last, when was this? Right, 99, when I was here in 99, before, before the Orange Revolution, before Euromaidan, before, before anything, the Ukrainian Institute of National Memory, and, um, People were going to, a bunch of Lviv residents were getting together where the Lonsky prison was, is now, memorial is now, and they were commemorating, they remembered those murders, the NKVD murders. And there was an interview in, in, in a newspaper with a young woman who, who was going past as they were gathering there, and she was asked why she wasn't participating, and she said, this is for older people, this is for, she said, what else, she said, and it's a good thing, it's a good thing that they're doing this, but I have my own uh, things to attend to. We have to reach a point, not us, I mean, I don't know, us or you, diaspora has the same problems, but we have to reach the understanding that we know this history, we no longer live through that history, we have our own preoccupations, we know that this past existed and we continue, we move on. That's the, that's the goal. Sorry, just... And by the way, this is very, uh, very uh, fruitful for politicians to speculate on this past. You know, the feelings, the emotions, the, the resentment, the feeling of being hurt. You know, you might forget about social things, about, you know, pensions or reform. But this, we suffered. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much for, for these questions that you've uh, raised today in your uh, lecture. I invite all of you, those of you who haven't seen it or, or, or who have seen it perhaps and would like to see it again, to see our exhibitions and think about what uh, Professor Himka discussed today. And uh, I also wanted to, to, to take your attention for another second. I want to talk about our next event as part of this exhibition because it, it, is, uh, it is special because of its format, because it won't be happening here. On the 11th, on November 11th, at the Philharmonic, you are invited to a musical performance, um, the East, East West Street, Song of Good and Evil, and this, is, um, this will be a performance, an event, uh, based on the, the research and the uh, writing of Philip Sands. 
the East West Street, which you're probably all aware of. It got this year's uh, uh, forum. It got the award at this year, this year's Lviv Forum, and it's the story of three lawyers who were united by Lviv and the Second World War. Two of whom are lawyers who formed the concept of uh, genocide and uh, crimes against humanity. And the third one is Hans Frank, uh, who was a uh, governor general of of the well, uh, general government. Uh, and this will be the story of these lawyers, of Lviv, and of uh, classical music. So you're all invited to the Philharmonic. The tickets are on Nostroli, are online. The event will be, should be very interesting and uh, will probably also need reflection. Um, thank you.